What's going on guys, this is Rob, and if you're enjoying the content that I'm uploading onto my channel, then feel free to subscribe, and you can also offer suggestions on topics and characters and storylines and whatnot that we can have discussions on uh, later on in this channel. So continuing our coverage of DC Rebirth, what I want to do here is I want to talk about Aquaman Rebirth, issue number one. Now, the reason why I want to cover this as a one shot, because it's basically like a prologue to the first story arc of the Aquaman Rebirth publications, is because I want to test the waters here. Uh, <laughs> no pun intended. I wanted to test the waters here and see how people respond to Aquaman. That's why I've tried to make this title as clickbaity as possible uh, in order to basically draw in as many views as possible. And the reason why is because in the realm of superheroes, Aquaman really kind of has a bad rap. He really has a stigma about him. And for those of you guys who don't know, this really dates back to the original Super Friends TV show. You know, Aquaman was depicted as the guy who talked to fish. And that was really the killing blow. You know, that was the, that was the dagger in the heart of Aquaman. From that point going forward, he was a superhero that was never really taken seriously. Now, it doesn't mean that he was taken all that seriously seriously before that that show he was never really on the same level as like batman or superman but he was still considered to be a hero in the traditional sense that is to say fans still took him relatively seriously for a comic book character the issue with this is that after you know the super friends show he just kind of became an on-running gag now dc did what they could to really bolster him up and in fact the aquaman of the 1990s if you go and, and you know talk to anybody who is uh, who was reading dc comics back then they'll tell you aquaman in the 1990s was a badass i mean he had the hook for the hand he was hardcore he was pretty brutal, but people loved it because it was a total opposite. It was it was the exact opposite of how people perceived him as goofy and nonsensical. The problem with this was that it was difficult to keep that story going on for any real measure of time because different writers had different views of his character. It was much the same way in the New 52. When DC came back and they did a total reboot of their uh, of their publications with the exception of the Green Lanterns and uh, of Batman, Aquaman was one of the characters who was rebooted. And under the writing of Jeff Johns, the character really received a deep focus in the sense that Jeff Johns did not shy away from the perception of Aquaman as a guy who talked to fish. And in fact, this was addressed within the first issue, I think, when Aquaman was greeted with a fan, you know, or, or someone who knew who he was. And he said, you know, the fan said, aren't you the guy that talks to fish? And Aquaman said, I don't talk to fish. You know, it was something about subtle manipulations or whatever it is. You know, at the same time, it was also an instance whereby the question was, if you are the king of Atlantis and you are standing up for, you know, basically the, the inhabitants of the oceans, why are you eating seafood? And so these are the kind of questions that Jeff Johns addressed in the stories, and it was done very tastefully, and it was done very well. The issue with this is that, again, much like virtually any comic book publication, different writers have different takes on the character. And as time progressed and Jeff Johns left the title, other writers picked up the title and started changing things up to the point where they didn't really care. You know, a lot of fans didn't really care for what was going on, and the Aquaman publication began to slip in sales consistently. Now, something else to point out here is that there is an extreme extremely die-hard Aquaman fan base, and woe be tied the poor soul that walks up to them and says, Aquaman talks to fish, you know it and I know it. They'll lose their, they'll lose their minds. <laughs> they'll actually, they'll absolutely freak. And that's natural in the realm of comic books. And with any comic book character or any team, you're always going to find the really, really huge fans who don't like people talking bad about them, simply because no one likes it when somebody walks up to you and says that what you like is dumb. People don't like that. You know, no one really enjoys that. And so one of the other aspects here was the character of Mira. Now, Mira, of course, course, we know to be the long-running wife of Aquaman, but one of the things that people, that, that really split the Aquaman audience base in uh, in the New 52, was that instead of being a queen who was loyal to Aquaman and loyal to Atlantis, but also strong and confident and intelligent, in the New 52, she was basically depicted as being short-tempered. She'd lose her mind all the time. She'd freak out over everything. You know, she had a really short temper with people. It's not necessarily a bad thing. There are benefits to that. The problem is that it wasn't the wonder, it wasn't the uh, mirror that people were used to. It wasn't the version that people liked the most. And this is the purpose of DC Rebirth. The purpose of DC Rebirth is to drive fan engagement, but also drive sales. When it comes to comic books, you drive sales through storytelling. That's really it. People don't really care who the hero is, so long as the story is good. That's one of the reasons why Batman outsold Superman for such a long amount of time, because the stories were so well written, as opposed to the Superman stories, which were not very well written at all. It's also the reason why the current run of Superman is so good and selling so well, because the stories are so 
beautifully written. With Aquaman, it's much the same way. As long as the stories are good, people will buy it. So in terms of good storytelling, you'll draw in fans. In terms of the characters, you'll keep existing fans. And that's the idea behind Dan Abnett's writing. Now, something I'd also like you to take note of here is that we're given a kind of inner monologue here with regards to uh, the life of Aquaman. And what I really like about what Dan Abnett does is he doesn't kick things off by focusing on the surface. And that's really what been like a big source of contention for Aquaman. We knew that he you know, was born from the surface. We knew that he discovered his history as Aquaman being the, the rightful king of Atlantis. His mother hailed from Atlantis. We, you know, we knew that whole legacy about his character, but one of the big drawbacks was that there was always so much emphasis on Aquaman trying to adapt to life in the surface. With Aquaman as a character, you have to focus on the oceans. That's where his bread's buttered. That's where he hails from. That's where his the, the best aspect of his stories can come from, especially when it comes to the villain of Black Manta. And so the idea here is that we basically return to this, Dan Abnett brings us back to the oceans and says that just because Aquaman is king of the oceans doesn't mean that everything is perfect. We always knew that he had his own villains in the oceans, but with regards to this situation here, we're also being refreshed. We're, you know, we're being brought back to the idea of the Deluge. Now, for those of you guys who don't know, the Deluge is basically kind of uh, this, this rebel faction within the kingdom of Atlantis. With regards to Atlantis itself, it very much has a hierarchy like the surface world, you know, for you know, right, wrong, or otherwise. In our everyday lives, we have a hierarchy. There's a hierarchy of attraction. There's a hierarchy of wealth. There's a hierarchy of intelligence. It starts at the very top with the wealthy, most, you know, most attractive, or the most intelligent people all the way down to the bottom with those who are least attractive, least wealthy, and least intelligent. With Atlantis, it's much the same way. You have the royal family at the top. You have Aquaman, you have his wife, you know, but then at the bottom, you have what's called the ninth level, or you have people who basically refer to themselves as bottom feeders. Now, again, Dan Amna tells us this is not designed to be a slur term. It's not designed to tear them down. It's simply what they are in that society. And those individuals recognize that. But in addition to this, the deluge basically recruits from those individuals. Now, the reason why Dan Abnett gives us such a strong understanding of this is that these people who are at the, the bottom of the food chain, so to speak, in the realm of Atlantis aren't cast outs. There aren't, they aren't people who are just kind of trying to make their way. They serve a purpose. But more so than that, their loyalty to Atlantis is of the utmost. That is to say, their loyalty is, is almost rabid. You know, when it comes to Aquaman, when it comes to uh, Mira, they, they basically have to play dual roles. You know, Aquaman has to play the role of the surface dweller while also maintaining his role as king of Atlantis. He has to fight alongside the Justice League, he's as much an ambassador to the surface as he is a ruler of Atlantis. You know, he basically represents Atlantis to the surface world, and he tries to maintain ties or good ties between the surface and Atlantis as best he can. And for those individuals at the bottom, they don't share this. They basically say Atlantis basically needs to maintain its traditional pure tones. We do not need to have a king that goes to the surface. Our king should swear absolute fealty to Atlantis and should never swear fealty to anything else. He should have absolute dedication to us, you know, and should not delve into the surface world. More so than that, you know, these people at the bottom basically view the surface world as, you know, as pollution. They view the surface world as, as a problem. Now, Dan Abnett tackles this on two fronts. When he says that they're basically a pollution to the oceans, it's done in two ways. The first is that people on the surface don't really concern themselves with what goes on in the oceans. And because of this, they're doing no favors to people who are in the oceans. That's the first thing. The second thing is that by virtue of the first, people not caring about the oceans oceans are polluting the oceans. They're throwing trash in the oceans. There's, you know, there's radiation and so on and so forth that goes into the oceans. And because of that, the Atlantean population does not look at the surface world with favorable eyes. Now, the other half of this is that because Aquaman is basically fighting against the deluge, trying to keep this, uh, this rebellion at bay, when Queen Mera is addressed by one of the soldiers, the question is also, should they bring in their, their elite warriors? You know, should they bring in the, uh, the drift? Now the drift is basically like the super advanced guard. All right, these are the best of the best when it comes to Atlantis' soldiers. The other part is bringing in the entire army to wage war, or I guess to take out the, the full forces of the Deluge. Now, the reason why Mira says this should not be done is because the surface would become aware of what's going on and their focus may begin to shift away from Aquaman being a superhero to Aquaman being a, a problem, you know, to Aquaman being a hassle. Now, Dan Abnett doesn't say this directly, but if we were to read between the lines here, we could probably get away with making the case that because Mira and Aquaman are ambassadors, ensuring the surface world maintains a perception of Aquaman is just as important as Aquaman acting out that perception. And so if 
this conflict were to be were to, were to become known by the surface world, it would give off the indication that Aquaman cannot control his own people. And the question is, if Aquaman can't control his own kingdom, what hope does he have of being an effective superhero on Earth? And so public sentiment would begin to shift away from support for Aquaman and begin to basically move towards the idea that he's an incompetent superhero. Now, this is basically kind of like Dan Abnett tapping into the uh, the run of Jeff Johns, not directly. It's more or less uh, like an indirect kind of reference to it in the sense that Jeff Johns dealt very heavily with the idea of Aquaman being perceived as an inept superhero, that his powers weren't that great. He was a guy that talked to fish. You know, people didn't take him seriously. The idea is to avoid that perception from coming true. Now, we know by virtue of going through this comic that Aquaman is pretty badass in terms of the things that he's capable of, in terms of his strength, his might, his dedication to Atlantis while also trying to uh, maintain ties to the surface world. But one of the other things Dan Abnett also does too is he shows both sides of the perspectives of Aquaman. It's only for an instance, it's not for a huge deal, but there are a couple of fans who are basically looking at the cover of Time Magazine, which depicts Aquaman, Wonder Woman, and Superman standing together. One of the fans says that Aquaman is extremely hot. The other one says that she doesn't care about a superhero that talks to a seafood platter. This basically represents the fan base, or this represents the reader base of DC. It represents those of you guys out there who will always say that Aquaman just talks to fish. He's just a superhero that talks to fish. That's all he does. But it also represents the fan base that says, no, he doesn't. He is a legitimate superhero. It's just, they don't grasp how awesome Aquaman is. <laughs> you know, but the fact remains here that with Aquaman holding his own against the deluge, this is basically just an argument. This is a this is a depiction by Dan Abnett telling us this is where things stand. Yes, Aquaman defeated the deluge, or the leader of the deluge. Yes, Aquaman's able to hold his own. Yes, Aquaman is a formidable hero. But it's Dan Abnett telling us that the stories of Aquaman are not just about him being a superhero on the surface, fighting alongside the Justice League, and being misunderstood by society. That the Kingdom of Atlantis has its own problems. It has its own issues. There's a lot of things to cope with. There's a lot of things. To to handle, that being a king is not the easiest thing in the world. And so as this story begins to wrap up, what we learn is this entire exposition, this entire monologue as it's been given to us is basically coming from Black Manta. And what he does is he says that Aquaman is effectively a killer. Aquaman is a murderer. And this is basically Dan Abnett telling us this is the root behind why it is that Black Manta is going to go forward as a villain of Aquaman and why it is that he considers himself Aquaman's main enemy. Now, if you guys are interested in learning more about this, if you guys want to know more about why it is a Black Manta is such a foe, make sure you guys drop a like, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps and uh, post a comment down below. You know, let me know what you guys think about all this. You know, let me know what your guys' feelings are because you know, I, I really enjoy what Dan Abnett is doing with Aquaman right now. I feel like following the writing of Jeff Johns, this kind of storytelling was much needed for Aquaman's character. And I feel like it's a great step towards reinvigorating him for the DC Rebirth line of comics going into the future in terms of moving him away from the guy that just talks to fish or at least showing up what kind of superhero Aquaman really is. But with that being said, we're going to bring this video to an end. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I will catch you guys later. Peace.